this episode of Skeptico. A show about connecting with the other side. Someone close to you has passed away. Yes. This person, your brother. No, Jace. Don't leave me. I don't want to be here without you. He's here. He, he says, if you're worried about being on your own, don't be. You're not. Because he is you. And you are him. And wouldn't you know it, love's getting in the way again. I have so much trouble saying it because I sound like a hippie, but like, it's all about love. It's I hate saying it, but that's where the data point. So that's what we got to do. So if you want to hear from your deceased loved ones, like you got to do love. That first clip was from the movie Hereafter, and that was Matt Damon. And the second was from today's guest, Dr. Julie Beischel, who is probably the world's leading researcher on after death communication science. Yes, science. If you listen to this show while well, you know this is really kind of a heart and soul of Skeptico kind of show, I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality. I'm joined today by Dr. Julie Boschel. Dr. Boschel has a new book out. The new book is titled Love in the Afterlife, How to Stay Connected with Your Human and Animal Loved Ones. I have pulled it up here on Amazon. It is great to have you back. I've known Julie for a long time, been a huge fan of her just super important work. Julie, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I've been social distancing for three years now, so it's a wonderful opportunity to put on a clean shirt and earrings. So thank you for having me. Are you kidding? This is no. such... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. We can all get... I can. I can. I enjoy my social distancing very much. So I, I hold to that very strongly. For those of you who don't know, who haven't been around for Skeptico for years and years... You may not know, Julie is really, we can dance around it, probably the foremost authority in the world on after-death communication, at least scientific authority. You know, PhD, publishes peer-reviewed papers, writes books, goes to conferences. And I was just thinking about this as we're putting this together. What a cool thing. I would love to be the foremost authority in the world on almost anything, let alone probably one of the most fundamental questions in science, even though it's ignored by science, which is, hey, can you really talk to dead people? So I think that's kind of cool. Do you ever think about that? <laughs> yeah, there's no question that affects more people than what happens when we die. And so it is not, it is, it is applicable to everyone. This is a really important topic, but because of the current scientific paradigm scientific materialism which states that it hypothesizes it's just a theory that the brain makes consciousness because that's the dominant paradigm it's like not allowed to even consider the possibility that consciousness is something different and is only channeled by the brain funneled by the brain not made by the brain Right. And so, you know, there's so many ways that we can approach this. I thought we should start with the book because the book is new and the book is interesting. A lot of people make their way to after death communication through grief, through bereavement. And that's really even your story way back in the day. And that's, I think, where this book is coming at, coming at it from too, is that people may come across this from that very unfortunate kind of life circumstance. Do, do you want to speak to that both personally and from the standpoint of an author putting together a book? Yeah, thank you. I've been in this field for 20 years and I collected all this data with mediums under blinded conditions, quintuple blinding, where there's five levels of blinding. Nobody knows anything. It can't possibly be cold reading. It can't be cueing and published that in 2015 um, I now work at the Winbridge Research Center. We're a charity and we offer all this free educational material, fact sheets and whatever, where often uh, peer reviewed journals are behind a paywall. So this is now you have free access to this information, summarizing it. If you're not a scientist, then I've uh, changed the language so that you can understand it if you're a regular person. And 20 years, I'm like, I've done a lot, but I don't think it's helping people on the ground the way I would like it to. So our most 
recent study that was published, um, we did a blinded study and with 10 uh, Windbridge certified research medium. So it's the mediums on my team. They've gone through an extensive training, screening, certification procedure, and um, demonstrated their abilities under controlled conditions. And so 10 of them participated in two readings. One, uh, they were given the first name of a living person. One, they were given the name of a deceased person. They didn't know which was which. They didn't even know they were going to get one of each. They were instructed um, you might get two deceased people, two living people. Um, and they did, we, and they, we, so we gave them a name and then we said, what did the person, what does the person look like? Uh, what are their, what's their personality characteristics? What, how do they spend their time? And then after each reading, they filled out a standardized questionnaire called the Phenomenology of Consciousness Inventory, which quantifies 26 different dimensions of consciousness. So it, it tracks things like memory, like in a mediumship reading, the when it's over, the medium doesn't necessarily remember everything that they said. Their sense of time is like a little skewed. When I go, okay, your 15 minutes is up, they're surprised. Like, so it quantifies all these different things. And we thought, well, they're both psychic phenomena, so they're going to look similar. And they did. They're both much different than a, the normal waking consciousness. But how do they differ from each other? And the one thing of 26 different dimensions of consciousness, the one thing that was different, they experienced statistically more love when they were reading for a dead person under blinded conditions than a living person. And that matches their reports, their phenomenology. They talk about love when they talk about mediumship readings. And, but, you know, I'm a hard scientist and I was like, love, that sounds so woo woo. It's, oh, I don't want, I don't, I, I wish it didn't happen like that, but I got to follow the data. I'm a good scientist. And so I was like, well, let's, let me look into this. And wouldn't you know it, that's a really common theme in all kinds of afterlife topics like near death experiences. The word love is in there more often than the tunnel or the light. That's how ubiquitous love is in the afterlife. So I was like, I got to follow the data. I got to get this to the people. And so I wrote this book about the, the evidence from controlled science, controlled research for love in the afterlife. It's all there and all just not just mediumship near-death experiences, end-of-life experiences. So that was the purpose of this book. Hey, man, that's awesome. And that's like kind of the full furnace blast of uh, uh, Dr. Julie Baishel research. And there's so many things to pick apart there to kind of lay out. And and I think we sure. do need to recover ground that you cover all the time. I'm just going to let this play in the background because the words really don't mean anything, but someone can read the title, The Bizarre World of Fake Psychics, Faith Healers and Mediums. And I, I guess the point that I want to make is there still is this lingering doubt about mediums, about after-death communication, and how it's all fake. When you first came into this, you decided that you could approach this scientifically, and you could control for this. And in some ways, you could control for it relatively easily, reading. Okay. So how we control for it, how we address it in the laboratory, we want to make sure two things are in play. An optimal environment... Because if you're like, oh, we're going to hold her underwater and she couldn't do it, that means it's all fake. No, that's you have to have an optimal environment, uh, experimental environment. You have to you have to mimic the real world, uh, like a real world reading as close as possible. But then two, you have to maximize controls. So you have to address anything normal that it could be. So when we do, uh, when I do readings, it's it's the medium and me on the phone. I serve as what's called a proxy sitter. So the living person who wants to have a reading, they're this called the sitter. So I serve as the proxy sitter um, for the absent sitter who wants to hear from their deceased loved one. So the medium and I are on the phone. All we have is the first name of a deceased person. And then I ask them specific questions. What did the person look like? How did they die? What is their personality? And Julie, when you yeah. say that's all you have... 
that is all you have. So right. I just want to make Correct. sure we feel understand when you say blinded, you know, someone else has selected that person and you do not know who that person is. Correct. That's correct. So then we do it a second time with a different name. Again, I don't know anything. We do it all again. Then we tra I transcribe the two readings into itemized list. Then the absent sitters receive those two readings, um, but they each receive both of them. And they don't know which was intended for their person. They don't know um, which is theirs. And so that controls for uh, rate or bias. Like some people have the tendency to give the medium the benefit of the doubt and score everything as correct. And some people don't want to give the medium any room and score everything as incorrect. So when you have two, your bias equalizes. So, so we look at a number of mediums. Um, and so we've eliminated rate or bias hold reading because there's no way uh, a medium, the medium can get anything from me because I don't know anything. Um, hot reading, they can't look anything up. We, there's, they, uh, um, they're blinded to any information besides the name. Um, and so all of these things that someone can go, oh, it's just this. Oh, they're reading cues. They look the person up on Google, on Facebook. They no, none of those things are even possible. I just heard an interview recently with a hypnotist, and I almost was tempted to kind of talk to these people, but it's pointless. They, they just don't know what they're talking about. And yeah. he says, I do fake medium readings. And he gives an example. He goes, here's how I do it. You know, when I'd ask you and I'd say, well, isn't it this? Isn't it that? And I'm just sitting there and going, oh, I'd love to have this person on the phone. And and I do uh, Winbridge, Dr. Byshult, uh reading where I'd be, okay. Here's the name, James, go. Well, what about this and that? I, I don't know. All I have is the name. So, it's impossible at that point for anyone to do any cold reading. We also, we ask the medium to answer specific questions so that you have to say what the person looked like, what's their personality, how did they die, what specific message do they have for the sitter? And the so that can, that providing information so general, it could apply to a lot of people, that's another form of cold reading. So that's controlled for. You know, so so glad you mentioned that. And I've heard you say this before, even if it is genuinely important and valuable information to the person who's getting the reading, because later on they get the full thing and they go, oh, wow, that was so meaningful. It might be something that Winbridge said, you know, I, I'm sure it was, but we didn't include it in because it wasn't specific in our criteria. You're even more picky a lot of times than the than the actual client who's getting the reading, right? Is that correct? Oh, Yeah. Yeah, because if they if they mention, you know, like if I give them the name and it's Charles and they're like, oh, I'm seeing the the Charles in Charge TV show from the 80s. I go, I can't put that because that will give away which reading has the name Charles in it. So I, I blind the readings so the sitter doesn't have any information about which thing is which, which reading is theirs. So um, and, you know, the the skeptical community will say, oh, well, you can look up a lot of actuarial tables and figure out, well, someone named Charles probably was born in this time. And so they probably died in this time. Okay. Prove it. Prove it that that's what a medium is doing. Prove it and show your work. Show where you looked it up because anybody can be a medium. You could get the, you could get the name Charles and like get, Charles could want to get to the sitter and want to talk to you. So you can't, you have to prove your work. You have to prove where you can find that information. How did Charles die? Maybe that's in the actual tables. Mostly it's cancer. No, no, not this Charles. What did he look like? What was his personality? What were his specific messages for the sitter? Remember when we went to that pizza place that one time? You're going to get that in your actuarial tables? I don't think so. So it peeves me. And maybe we'll talk about this later on in terms of the push that science still has to kind of deny this, because I, I think it, it does crop up and it crops up in terms of where Winbridge is at, where you are at in this 20 years and where you thought you might be. I mean, I certainly, you know, I've known you for a long time. Your research was so really monumental. And you know, there were a lot of people early on saying, this is it. This cracks the code, gold standard for proving this. And it hasn't, you know, kind of bowled everybody. Do you ever think about 
the the momentum in the other direction and what's behind that is just people don't want to change they don't want to change their beliefs yeah. that's the bottom line is people don't uh they don't want to change and there's you know there's sort of your neurology depending on who you are cannot fathom um new ideas or something that goes against what you already believe like people who are open minded personalities when they hear something new that goes against what they believe or they don't know about it, the frontal cortex lights up and the brain goes, oh, let's learn more about that. But people who are skeptical and conservative, when they hear new information, literally the amygdala lights up and it goes, this is very dangerous. And you have a fear response in your body. So your brain and your body don't let you even comprehend it, don't even let you entertain it. Because it, it, your brain interprets it as dangerous because it's new and it's different. So those people are neurologically incapable of hearing me. So I'm not talking to them. You know, you may not be talking to them, but they're kind of talking to us. I just pulled up Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I, I just want to make sure this is still current. He's still kind of spinning this stuff. But in you know, here's he's got a couple million views on a video, life and death, the cosmic perspective. And he just says, Hey, there's zero scientific evidence for anything after death. And I want to go, no, you just, that's just not true. You just haven't looked you haven't, you haven't done what a scientist would do is to say, are there any observable evidence that I should consider? And then I consider it. He's just kind of making a blanket, blanket statement. Or, you know, here's the other one I'd pull up that I, I thought was Joe Rogan, you know, you can't get any more mainstream than that in terms of number of views. You know, here's another 4 million views. And here's Lex Friedman, who I really like. And but here is maybe the switch in position that we have among science. And it's Lex saying, well, it's kind of unknowable. And I would never venture a guess at the question of what happens after death. And then Joe's just patting him on the back and goes, Wow, that's such a great answer. I'm so glad you said you just know and it's unknowable. And I thought, you know, it's exactly in contrast to your work where where you as a scientist have said, well, let me see to what extent it is knowable and let, let me go try and know. I have so much to say about that. So, well, one, it's ridiculous to think we know how everything in the universe works. We're like a baby society. We're brand new. We don't, there's no way we can know everything. There's a lot of mystery and a lot, that's a lot of the um, pushback is that we, well, we don't know how this works. You don't have a mechanism laid out. Well, yeah, we don't know why you, people yawn or dream. There are like a bazillion drugs on the market with the, unknown mechanism of action you can look it up what's it how does this work mechanism of action unknown they still sell it you still take them you still feel better we can't explain it the mechanism is not necessary for something to be real and you know the 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 over the dominant scientific paradigm materialism wants us to explain how this can work in a materialist framework well, it doesn't. It can't. No, it can't work in a framework where the brain is trapped in the where the mind is trapped in the brain. No, of course it can't work like that. But that's not right. That's not how consciousness works. So it it's it's totally plausible if you take it from this other um the the alternative, which is the the mind consciousness is non-local. It's not localized inside the skull. It can acquire information and affect change and uh outside the brain and even past death and so if you just look at it like that then yeah it's totally plausible it totally works and then the other piece is this has been a part of human experience for eons all over the world why do we think in our little tiny western modern view that we know oh this can't possibly be happening well it's been happening since all of eternity, all over. So no, what? why do you think your brand new idea from modern society is the right one? Like, that's silly. That is totally illogical. Right. And I'm going to go back and play this clip from, from uh, Lex Friedman, because I want you to comment on it specifically. I'm going to play it into the show. 
Do you think there's something else that happens to you when your body stops existing? Do you think your consciousness transcends this this dimension? I think uh, I think I'm not smart enough to even think about that. That's a great answer. So uh, uh, I think everybody on Earth has that exact same answer if they're being honest. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's really, that's, th there's a lot of mystery in the world, and that's the most. Yeah, uh, but hold on, hold on, Dr. Bush. Oh, no. here's my point. Okay. No free pass on that. You, you didn't, you know, so you got into this through grief and bereavement brought you to the scientific doorway of kind of looking into this, but you didn't do what he did. You didn't say, oh gosh, uh, there's just no way I could ever, there's plenty. You, your whole uh, career here in terms of exploring this topic is a direct refutation of what he said. Yes, we can know more. Yes, there is well, some okay. things. We can know more. We can't understand it completely. Yeah, there's a lot like there are science like the like textbooks on the um, scientific method and they always use, oh, well, there are some things science can't address and they always use life after death like oh that's something science can't address in no way shape or form no that's not true um we, we probably as embodied consciousnesses in this living existence we probably can't understand it fully i bet that you probably don't even understand it fully as a dead person on the other side like there's this is all very complex and we're never going to know all of it um, but to say, oh, no, we can't look at it at all. No, we, there's lots of pieces we can look at. And I want to be clear because I'm criticized to go, well, you need it to be true because you miss your mom. No, I didn't. We have a we had a terrible relationship. I was glad that she was dead. That's awful. But that's the truth. I didn't need it to be true when she died. And I looked into it. It was like right at the time um, John Edward was big on TV. And it was like the first time I ever heard of a medium. And it gave me, well, this is interesting. Let me look into this as a scientist. And that's how I got. So the 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 dead mom was gave me the opportunity to um, look into something I didn't know anything about, but I didn't need it. I, I was kind of upset that it was, oh, look, it they are still around. Like, oh, no. And that's changed. In 20 years, that's changed. Um, but that's where I came. Like, so it, I don't want to say grief and bereavement got me into this. A, a death close to me allowed me to look into a thing I didn't know anything about, but I didn't need it to be true. Well, thanks for clarifying mm -hmm. that, because that's an important distinction. But I still, there's something there to explore, I think. And it, this is ground that we've covered before, but it's good to kind of cover it again, particularly with this book, because... I think this book is approaching people who are coming into this thing from that angle, which is understandable. You know, they've lost a loved one and we'll return to talking about love because, hey, that's such an important point you made at the very beginning that love in this way that we can't describe it, can't understand it is the driving force. And I've certainly heard that from near-death experience researchers. But I love what you said about the the mechanism. We can't understand the mechanism. And I guess I tie that right back to the mechanism of grief. You know, I mean, grief is 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 a nasty thing for a lot of people. And, it, you know, maybe it, it didn't affect you in exactly the way that it affects other people. Or, you know, probably I'd be more kind of inclined and have been more like you probably. But that doesn't mean anything. But there is a mechanism surrounding grief and bereavement that has brought a lot of people into your research into this curiosity about you know the afterlife how have you thought about that dealt with that particularly with the people that that contact you and want to know more and read your books and read your articles and all the rest of that i want to say too that uh i had a, a dog my dog moose that i had for 15 years when when Moose died, I I did know what grief was. I did feel it for the first time, I think. And and then uh, I tell this story in the book. Um, we have the house. There's a house in our neighborhood that's a rental, and a woman was renting it, and she was uh, her husband, the love of her life, died unexpectedly, and so she was in the throes of acute grief. And and I spent a lot of time with her. 
And this was before I really knew anything about grief. And so I got to see it firsthand and I got to watch it transform. And, um, and so I, I tell that story uh, in the book, but she, she, you know, she would, she like, at one point she showed me a picture of herself and she says, this is what I looked like before I died. And so when she, when he died, I don't want to cry. Um, she experienced it as not like a piece of me has gone. She was like, I'm, I died. I'm not me. I died. And so to watch that transform was really interesting, but I wanted to make sure to include animals in this book, because I think a lot of people, even if you don't know any people um, close to you that have died, you probably have um, animals that you loved. And so there's a whole chapter about um, animal consciousness is the same as human consciousness. And there's lots of evidence for animals on the other side in, in not just mediumship readings, but again, in near death experiences and these other topics. So I wanted to bring that because um, that's, it's a different kind of grief. And it's, I think, more difficult to go through because our society is like, ah, just a dog, get over it. Like, no, that is my best friend, my member of my family. And so I wanted to, to um, give people the evidence, like, no, it's okay to believe that that was a member of your family, because it was, and it's okay to believe that you are having spontaneous experiences of the animal still with you. And, you know, there are stories that I shared with people that, um, you know, they hear the animal or they feel them lay in the bed with them, or like, there's all kinds of spontaneous experiences that people have. Those are totally normal. And those are totally real. You're not having a hallucination. That is the survived consciousness of someone you loved spending time with you. That's so awesome. And I just kind of ping pong back and forth because I, I keep wanting to say back to what I said before is, this is monumentally important research. There's 20,000 dissertations kind of waiting to happen from so many things you said. Like you just said something. You said human consciousness is no different than animal consciousness. And you just said it kind of matter of factly. I interpret that to mean is based on my work in terms of after death communication, I don't see any measurable difference, at least at first glance, between and, and that would lead me to speculate that perhaps there are more similarities between human consciousness and animal consciousness. This is radically different from anything that they so there you go. There's you know five, ten but, dissertations right there. But it's not, it's not because the like a bunch of materialist neuroscientists got together many years ago. I cite it in my book, and they they were like, what is consciousness? And they declared that animals do have consciousness just like we do octopuses, you know, mammals, primates, everything. So even in mainstream science, the 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 human animal relationship is becoming more valued because uh, that there is evidence that animal consciousness is pretty much the same as human consciousness. But, but you get what I'm saying in terms of- I totally of, get it. I mean, you are taking this really, really, and with, without any exaggeration, you, you are kind of hinting at something that is profoundly different than our understanding because our understanding, normal day-to-day -day science understanding is that there's this difference. There's this huge difference between our self-awareness, our ability to plan, or da, 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 da. and then your research comes in and goes, don't see it. Sorry. You know, here we've looked at it. This You want to speak to that? Yeah. Again, I, it's silly to think that we understand how everything works. I think mystery is a really important part of human existence, like being okay with not understanding everything. And we, there's no way we can understand to where we could explain it, what it's like to be dead. Like there's no, no matter how much information we get from various sources, it's always interpreted through a living existence. And like, so we're never going to really understand it. But what we do know without a doubt is that there is plenty of evidence that consciousness is not localized to the brain. It's what's called non-local, it can, it can reach outside of the self and acquire information. Like the, everyone knows the stories of like moms who know 
um, their children have gotten car accidents all the way across the country. There's no way the brain can know that. That is a non-local consciousness. And so there's plenty of evidence that that exists. And I go through that. Um, like, how is an afterlife even possible is a chapter in my book, because there's plenty of evidence that when we're living, our consciousness is non-local. And then there's plenty of evidence that when the body dies, the consciousness is still exists non-locally because and not associated with the body and survives physical death. I want to, maybe at the risk of jumping around, I want to return to the love thing because sure. you laid it out right at the beginning of this interview and you laid it out just beautifully. I love how you said I was resistant to it. You know, I, I get that. I'm kind of the same way. I have fortunate. I have a lot of love in my life and a lot of family and all that, but I'm also kind of a business guy and kind of, you know, going through, you know, I, I, kind of, no, you know, no. So I appreciate where you're coming on this. I remember talking to Jeff Long, you know, just mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, of course, you know, one of the most noted, prominent near-death experience researchers. And he told me almost the exact same story. He said, you know, I've looked through all these accounts. I've looked through all this and everyone wants to, you know, they asked me about the tunnel, they have me out the life review because I got to say, you know, I'm just looking at the data now and the data is love at this like level that just doesn't make any sense. It's like 96% of people are saying the most important part of what I got out of this was love. Love is everything. Love is everything. And then you come through and you're coming at it from a totally different perspective from a totally different research angle. And you go, yeah, we're good to say it. You know, love. So, you know, what do we do with that? What, what it, it's a challenge, but what do we do with the fact that that's what it's all about. So chapter eight in Love and that Afterlife is, well, what what do we do with that? So if you want to hear from your loved ones and it isn't happening, uh, what I'm suggesting is you got to put more love in your life so that we can sort of mimic the energetics of the afterlife so that they can... You know, like, it's terrible here. People are awful. And it's terrible. If I was in the afterlife, I wouldn't come here. There's what good. I would never come here. It's terrible. And That's so, what you say now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and but so I suggest like, try, why don't you like try and condition your energetics to be more, you know, if you wanted to like play the stock market, you'd read a book by someone who's good at it. If you wanted to be an athlete, you read a book about so I ask the mediums, they're good at connecting with the other side. So if you want to connect with the other side, what do we know about mediums that you can do? And there's a lot that we know. So there are personality characteristics that you can try and turn up and turn down. And in order to, again, make you more conditioned to be connected to the other side. But, you know, if you just like everything that you do, like it sounds, oh, I have so much trouble saying it because I sound like a hippie, but like, it's all about love. It's, I hate saying it, but that's where the data point. So that's what we got to do. So if you want to hear from your deceased loved ones, like you got to do love. That's so such I have a, a lot of suggestions in chapter eight. And that's what I was pointing to earlier is this book is, practical in a way that's going to surprise you. And that's probably the biggest one of saying, okay, here's a practical science type person who's saying, you know, here's how you do it, but you're going to be kind of surprised with the answer, which is to bring more love into your life. And uh, again, the way you just laid it out there is completely unique and important and interesting. I tell you what, let's switch to another topic, just kind of a practical, but I want to check it off the list thing. Help people understand the different kinds of after-death communication. That's where I wanted to go next too. So yeah, there's four kinds of after-death communication and we can go through all four of those. But a mediumship reading is only one kind of way. So uh, there's what's called spontaneous after death communication, which like the name suggests is something that happens you didn't intend for it to happen. So dreams where people communicate with the other side, that's under the category of spontaneous. Then there's what's called facilitated, which is where you work with a clinician with very specific protocols that have been um, tested and peer reviewed and published and um, where they, they do 
you know, their protocol on you. And then, yeah, EMDR um, is one of them. Um, participating in a cycle me and TM is the other one. So I go through all these in the book. So, um, you know, it's not one size fits all, right? Maybe these other things too. And then we call a mediumship breeding assisted after death communication. So you're not experiencing the communication, but the medium is, and she's sharing the messages. So she is assisting you. Um, and then there's what I call, I coined the term requested after death communication. So that's where you engage in a practice or, you know, take ayahuasca or whatever with the direct or just simply ask for a message um, um, with the intent of receiving communication from the other side. So uh, at that, um, this is a good time to talk about uh, my guidance for grief cards. So I, I designed this deck of cards. And so, you know, people in the throes of grief, like you don't have, you can't often have the energy to have like attend a weekend workshop or see a therapist every week, whatever. But can you shuffle a deck of cards and pick one? I, you know, so this, um, these cards, it's 52 cards and there's four kinds of cards. So there's signs, which is, um, uh, I will tell you, this story uh but so this is a card this is one of the cards and so it says today i will be open to noticing a meaningful song or other piece of music as it might be a message from my loved one so if you pick this then you should and then you get that then that seems like good evidence that your person so i can tell you a quick story so we live next to a cemetery and often um someone comes and practices the bagpipe in the cemetery and they they um, play funerals sometimes and so um when I started, uh, one of the things that like got me, I got to share this stuff was, um, I, I got to learn to walk the talk. And so after 20 years and a terrible relationship in the physical life, I was like, okay, mom, I just said it, you know, in my mind, okay, mom, I think I'm ready to start having a relationship with you and I'm going to use these cards. And so, um, one of the first few days. Uh, so my mom hated the song Amazing Grace. Whenever we had to sing it in church, she would roll her eyes. She hated the song so much. And so um, uh, the, they were playing Amazing Grace on the bagpipes. The next day after I was like, you maybe come and be in my life. Uh, they were playing. And I was like, well, if you're going to be in my life, you got to put up with Amazing Grace on the bagpipes. So that's part of it. And uh, so these cards, you're sp supposed to pick one at the beginning of the day. I'm picking at the end to like say what happened to me in the day, not this is what I'm going to look for during the day. It's like what happened to me. So I was like, wouldn't it be crazy if I pulled that card and I shuffled the cards and that's the card that I pulled was the card about music. So that was a good sign for me. So that's how the science cards work. So I've asked Julie to pull up. Uh, the next card, the message card. And in the meantime, if you want, I've pulled up on the screen, the Amazon listing for guidance for grief, which looks really cool. And then Julie's going to tell us a, a message card. And I guess I'd like to hear more of the backstory too, of why you've encountered a lot of people who are in this situation and you're a scientist, but you're also a very caring person whether you want to kind of add that edge to yourself slick or not it <laughs> is so i'm sure that's part of what's what this is about is you like to see people not suffer so much our modern society is not good at helping us with our grief so i and i was reading all this stuff and like you know the clinicians know what helps people with grief the thing that's demonstrated to to best improve grief is what's called continuing bonds. So it's the recognition that your bond that with the person who has died still exists. So your relationship is just different now, right? They're, they're, they didn't, they're not gone. They're just different. And so recognizing your continuing bond with them is really good at alleviating the negative uh, feelings around grief. And so I was like, well, people need to be able to bring this into their lives. So I developed this deck of cards so that people had a way 
to every day, you know, ritual is very important in various things. And so they had just shuffled the deck, pull a card. And I even on my website at juliebphd.com, I have a card picker. So if you don't want to like do the shuffling and the, you know, you don't want it to be up to you. There's a random event generator that will pick the number of the card for you on my website. So the the continuing bonds, what is the what does the science look like behind that? How do you know what you just said is true? Okay. So back like in the Freud days, he called if you experience your deceased person still in your life, he considered that a delusion, a hallucination. And so from that point on, that's how the clinical community looked at it. It they it was dangerous. It 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 showed that you were not improving. And it was the what what therapists and whatnot told you to do when you were grieving and you were having trouble in your life was, you know, basically get over it and move on. And by the 1980s, the clinical community looked around and they were like, that that's not making people feel any better. And they were noticing that there were people who were thriving. They weren't just surviving, they were thriving. And what was different about them is that they recognized a continuing bond with the deceased loved one. And so there's been lots of research, you know, spontaneous after death communication experiences are really common. So it's pretty easy to study those. So they studied those kind of things. And then like this, this facilitated um, after death communication with the EMDR, the psychomantium, there's lots of evidence for that. And so those things demonstrate continuing bonds. And, um, and then what I'm suggesting is that's what these cards, these guidance for grief cards do as well. There's limited evidence that a mediumship reading does that because there's no, it's hard to do that research. There's no funding for this kind of stuff. And you've so, done some of that research, haven't you? And it's a little it, bit. It yeah. Points in that direction. It but... does point in that direction. And it just makes logical sense. There's, there's plenty of controlled, it's not controlled because people, they're spontaneous experiences. You can't bring those into the lab, but the, the, the clinical outcomes from them are, are demonstrated. You know, there's science behind that where people take tests and whatever, and um, their clinician agrees that their grief is improved after they have a spontaneous after death communication. So it makes sense that the, and so spontaneous does it, facilitated does it, makes sense that assisted would do it and that requested would do it. And I would think and suspect from what you said that re requested is just a natural kind of extension of all this stuff because there's going to be a requested aspect in a lot of these, right? You go to a medium, you're requesting. Yeah, you know, you exactly. go to get facilitated, you're requesting. So I think it's yeah. awesome that you formalized it. And these cards are terrific because they're so accessible in a way that kind of immediately makes people able to do it because there are still challenges with medium readings just in terms of which you've always been about, you know, finding the right medium, making it work for you, and then making that process work for you in terms of uh, going through it is, you know, it's not, not easy and not available to a lot of people. This is just perfectly available. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, when someone in our modern society, when someone you love is grieving, right, they've lost someone, it's, we really don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And so this is a product that you can like give to someone like, mm, maybe this can help you. And then you can feel like that you did something. I wanted to be able to provide something that people could give to other people when they knew they were suffering and go, look, I get it. Right. Because it's the afterlife is right in the description of the card deck. Like, so by giving it to someone, you're like, I get it. I believe in an afterlife, too. And I know it's not woo woo and it's not crazy. And so it's it hopefully will sort of create, you know, micro communities where it's OK in your group of friends to to talk about these kind of things. What's your gut sense about whether this is efficacious? particularly kind of as a scientist, whether do it yourself, do the cards, do the work, be more loving. Is that really going to make a difference? I truly think that it is. I think that like, so even if you don't receive a sign, like even if you pull the music card and you didn't hear any music that day, the, the idea that you think it's possible there, you've already established a relationship and not every, you know, not all, dead people are maybe good at bringing 
bagpipes to the cemetery or whatever. Like you have to, so these cards establish the relationship in a realistic way. So like, so the first kind of cards is signs. So that will help you figure out what signs. And the second kind are messages and it's from, from you to your departed loved one. So like this card, for example, says, dear loved one, I'm trying my best to let communication with you happen naturally and thank you for every message you send. And so it's you saying, I know this is a two-way relationship. And so when you pick this card, maybe this is what the relationship needed to hear that day. And that's the premise from all of this. And so then the, can I should move on? Then the third kind of card is called affirmations. Those are purple. And they, these are things that are at the, that when you look at grief research, this is what grief research knows. And so it's, this one says, I recognize that there's more to me than my loss. I am more than just grief. And so it's just things like that. I'm going to read one more. I understand that grief is different for everyone and the way I'm doing it is the right way for me. So when you pick this card that day, that's the universe, your deceased loved one, your higher self, whatever, I call them special forces, um, whatever energetic angels, you know, whatever your language is, it's all of those coming together using the power of randomness to get you the message that you need to hear that day. So the fourth um, kind of card are called wisdom. And so they're quotes, direct quotes from the mediums on my team. And so this particular one is from the medium Daria Justin. And she says, put your preconceived notions aside and open yourself up to the subtleties of how energetic messages arrive. You're looking for fireworks when you should be looking for fireflies. And so it's things like that, that like, let's, again, let's talk to the people who communicate with the departed regularly and see what they have to say. So there's these four different ways that you can get the, the, what you need to hear that day to, to address your grief to you. Yeah, that's, that's super awesome. You got to find a way to support Winbridge Research Center. I mean, don't you, after you hear this again, if you're not move to say this is science that we need to move forward but what will people find at the website these articles are great what yeah, are mediums they, and how do scientists study them uh, why medium research is important grief and after death communication nicely done tell tell folks about the website yeah so there's lots of these um web articles that are just right on the website but then if you go um to the menu there and go to education then so we did Winbridge Research Center Afterlife Symposium, and we had 11 sessions. And so it's open access. So there's 11 conference videos that you can watch for free. You don't have to sign up. They're just open access. And, and we're, we're talking about all kinds of things, using remote viewing to view the afterlife, mediumship, all kinds of things. So I interview a doctor that I know about, and he's been at the bedside of people as they died, like hundreds, if not thousands of people. So it's that sort of thing that the Winbridge Research Center does. And then if you scroll down, that big blue button is called fact sheets. So we have all these fact sheets where you can learn about our research and what we've found in like a couple pages PDF. And so these are printable, you can hand them out, you can have them when someone says something like... <laughs> One there is called, well, actually, responses to common misconceptions about mediums. So when someone in your life says something ridiculous, you can be, you can have that like, well, actually, it's this. And there's this research at the Wimbledon Research Center that shows this. And this particular fact sheet's colorful and funny, but most of them are just sort of straightforward. And so there's one, if you go back to the list, there's one about the accuracy testing and, and the blinded conditions and the five levels of blinding. And yeah, they're in, <laughs> we used to have like four and it wasn't hard to, there's one about animals, dreams. Where is, oh, there it is under the, well, actually testing mediums accuracy under controlled laboratory conditions. So there's the data that we showed that we've collected. And so I did a study at the University of Arizona when I was doing my postdoc there with eight mediums. And then at the Wimbridge Research Center, I've done 
another one with 20 mediums. And so originally 16 readings, then 58 more readings. And then now it's been replicated in another lab in Italy. And there's all kinds of evidence. Like it's not just me saying this, this is real. And so this, this fact sheet shows the protocol that we use, the data that we collected. And um, so again, if, if someone is saying there's no evidence, like 58 readings plus 16, plus these Italy, like it's, a, it's hundreds of readings under controlled conditions. Like that's a lie, that's you're wrong. If you say there's no evidence, you're just wrong or blind or like, Will willfully blind and not wanting to look at this these things, but it's there. So, but the Wimbridge Research Center is all about good science and free educational materials. So if you sign up for our email list, every time we have a new, we have videos up there, and every time we have a new interview or anything for free, we'll email it to you once a month. We send an email once a month. So please join our email list at the Winbridge Research Center website, which is winbridge.org. Fantastic. And I really encourage people to do it. And I really think that the the cards, which I wasn't aware of before we spoke, are really kind of a fantastic. They're just a fantastic tool. They feel, obviously, just from hearing about it, it fills a real gap because maybe the final thing we'll talk about, and then I'll, I'll let you go. I really appreciate the time. And I, I hope people do check out the book, Love in the Afterlife, because as we've spoken about, you know, it fills a lot of gaps for people who are coming at this and trying to find a way in and trying to kind of, they like, kind of like you or I like to kind of understand the stuff before they jump right in. But the last topic I want to make sure we do cover is there still is, I think, a lot of confusion about medium readings and about how to you know, select or not even how to select. It's like, oh gosh, could I even do that? And I'm afraid to do that. And just the standard thing on what you tell people when they approach you about mediums. So um, yeah, there's three chapters because that's what I know most about is mediumship. So there's three chapters about, um, it, so you want to get a mediumship reading. And because the big idea is there are three people involved in a mediumship reading and the medium is only one of them. And so you want a better mediumship reading, be a better sitter. And so there's so many things that people do wrong and that prevent it from going smoothly. And so I just spend three chapters. So what can you do before a reading? What can you do during a reading? And what can you do after a reading to optimize the process for everybody? And so, you know, first you want to like, why do I want a reading? There's four ways to connect with the other side. Why is it that you want a reading? Why is it that you want it now? And so like some self-assessment needs to take place. It's not just like, I'm going to get my hair cut. No, this is like a therapeutic intervention. It It isn't, but it's like one where you wouldn't, it's going to have a, in one shape or form, it's going to have an impact on your grief. So you don't want to just walk into it blindly like, let's see, it looks fun. No, this is like you are connecting with the other side. Like th there's no thing that nothing prepares us in our society. We're not trained in how to deal with any of this. So you really need to go into it with a clear head and for the right reasons. And then there's lots of things that you can do don't let anyone else pick a medium for you. It's it's a very um, personal thing. People say, you know, they want me to recommend one of our mediums. I never will do that. I never, not even to my closest friends. I know all I know about the mediums on my team is that they passed my test on that day with those dead people and those sitters. I cannot guarantee they're going to do it again. Like, I'm not going to order your dinner either. I'm not going to suggest anything. Like, th this is a very personal, intimate thing. So what I suggest is that you find, like, for example, at Wimbridge.org, we list the mediums on my team under the About Us button. And so go to that page, you know, click on out to their websites, and maybe one speaks to you or maybe. And so... Before you start going through the list, invite your deceased person. I'm going to go to a medium. Help me pick one. 
And so maybe there's like a website that the color reminds you of your person or there's something and, and, you know, or maybe you pick one and then it doesn't go well, like you can't, your email doesn't work. Oh no, that's a coincidence. No, that's the system saying you picked the wrong one. Try again, pay attention to the signs. If I could just interject something there, because we have known each other for a long time and I have learned from the master here because I've done some medium readings, both personally, but mainly kind of for the skeptical project to understand. So I could say that I've done it. And, you know, I think everyone is different, but the thing I would, I would put an exclamation point on something you said, but kind of from a different angle is like level-headed also to me means somewhat dispassionate, somewhat removed from it. Because the thing I'd say is I don't get a good medium reading. I don't immediately think that, oh my God, there's something wrong. This could never work. And as I've shared on the show, one of the more confirming things for me was I had a medium reading with, I'm pretty sure it was a a medium from the Winbridge Institute and it didn't go well. And you know what she did? She said, wow, this didn't go well. I think I should give you your money back. And I was like, whoa, mediums aren't supposed to do that. And then I picked another one and he said, this didn't go well. I think I should give you your your money back. And I'm not saying everyone's going to encounter that, you know, but it's like, because for me, I was a little bit detached a little bit, you know, but I was like, I will persist forward. It doesn't mean on this day at this time, it didn't work in the third time. It was incredibly meaningful to me and the uh, person on the other side, the medium did it. I think your, your advice is, is really solid. And I think, just being level-headed can mean a different thing to different persons. So please go on though, because you, you were talking about before, during, and after. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And so one of the things as you're choosing is you don't have to choose. There's lots of mediums in the world. And we did a survey where we surveyed, I think it was like three, 300 mediums, like claimant mediums. And only they didn't all charge like a, a small percentage of them charged, but a lot of them didn't. And so it's not, you know, we can, we can't say all mediums are in it for the money. Eh, a majority of them don't even charge any money. So that really shakes up your argument there, doesn't it? But one of the things that I suggest is do your due diligence as a consumer. This is a contractor you're hiring. You wouldn't just like, Oh, I bet the plumber will do a good job. You would look into it and you would know what the refund policy was. So if you know all those things and it isn't going well, you can stop a reading too. The medium can stop it or you can stop it. And if you know their policies before you get started, then they can't hurt you because you know about the refund policy or not, right? And so if you go into it level-headed of I'm hiring a contractor and, and just you know, maybe it'll work, but it is not definitive of your relationship. You still have a relationship with your deceased loved one. Whatever happens, you still have a relationship and don't like, I need proof. No, I got the, I'm the one at good at testing proof. You don't need to get proof. If you want to spend some time and reinforce the idea that your bond with your person continues then by all means, get a reading. But if you're trying to test a medium or prove any, no, it ain't for you. Go do something else. Don't waste her time because she's going to be able to connect people with their loved ones. Don't waste her time if you're, if you're trying to test somebody. Yeah. If you're like a medium should be able to, no, not for you, not for you. So I didn't mean to get us off track. I think you were talking about before, during, and after. I think we covered before. Do you want to quickly hit on during and after? Yeah, so there's lots of it, three whole chapters. But one of the things that you can do um, is, yeah, be mindful during the reading. And so uh, Laurel and Jackson calls it, don't feed the medium. So don't throw up information about your deceased person on the medium. They're, they'll get you... D- it's the first time that someone wants to talk about your dead person. Sorry, I got to stop saying you're dead person. It's very callous. I, in the book, I call them DLOs, your, your departed loved one. So it's the first time someone wants to talk about your DLO. And so your instinct, even if you don't think it is, it is, is to just throw, oh my gosh, my person wants to spend the like this and this time I want to talk. Like you're, you're going to want to do that. And and so be be mindful that that's going to happen and don't feed the medium as Laura says the medium will usually explain the way that they're going to do the thing and 
So, and you can explain the way you're going to do your thing. Go, I'm only comfortable answering the question, does that make sense? Right. And if they go, well, what about this thing? Go, I'm not going to answer that. And if they keep pushing and go, I don't think this is for me. I, I request a refund. Like it's total. you're, it's, you are hiring a contract. Like you, you're the customer, like you're the consumer. You, you can control it all along the way. So I suggest you only answer the question, does that make sense? And you only answer with yes, no, maybe, sort of, or I don't know. Because then they can't read. There's, there's so you're control. And again, you're not testing this medium, but you're trying not to mess with the system and feed, trying not to feed the medium. So if you, all you say is yes, no, maybe sort of, or I don't know, then it can't be cold reading. It can't. I think the advice you're giving is so incredibly important to follow because when you look back on the reading and you go, oh my God, could they have done this? If you follow the protocol you're talking about, you're going to have more confidence in saying, you know, I really didn't give them anything. There's no way. And it, 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 I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I think people go in thinking, no, no, I trust it. I can just, you know, continuing bonds and I'm just it. But you're going to have those moments of doubt. And if you follow your protocol, it's going to reduce that doubt, which I think is one of the most valuable things you can have out of it. Yeah. And to be clear, like I only ever got one medium reading in my whole life. And it was when my mom died. And then I, I haven't done it since. And because of our readings are so controlled, it's not like a reading. I don't really know what a reading is like, but the, I wrote those chapters based on what the mediums on my team shared with me and and seeing it happen in the lab i know it can happen without you feeding the medium at all so i know that's the right thing to do it does control for yeah because later you go well i did kind of tell her and so if you just go if your intention is like i'm just gonna have this experience and see if i feel like i spent the afternoon with my dlo so you know recognize your assumptions, what you what you think, manage your expectations, and recognize that in, with any kind of ADCs, spontaneous or assisted or requested, it has to be realistic. You can't be like, oh, well, you should make the sun go around the moon, then I'll believe it. No, it has to be realistic and possible and practical. And for example, me and other researchers who study mediums have found that about 30% of any reading is going to apply to other people because people are only so different. Um, oh, your mother was female? Oh, it, you know, like, no, uh, one, a medium is never going to say that, but it's not going to be unique. And you have to recognize that. Yeah, lots of people die from cancer. Lots of people have red hair. Those things are not going to be entirely unique, but people are not entirely unique. So again, your your sort of touchstone is, do I feel like I spent the afternoon with my DLO? That's really all you're looking for. Nice one. Any thoughts on the after? Do we want to touch on that after the reading? Oh, so the after is just reflect on what the medium said. So try it. Some mediums will record it. Some will let you take notes. Uh, reflect on what they said. Sometimes they'll say, things that don't make sense. And so you want to keep track of those things because they might come true in the future. You might have to check with other people in your family to verify them. They might, some mediums will be like, you know, look up this book or see this movie or that sort of thing. So you want to make sure that you follow through and then you just want to have gratitude that even if you don't feel like you spent the afternoon with the person, be like, well, thank you for trying. You know, maybe we'll do it again at a different time um, that you want to always have gratitude because we don't know. Again, this is all it's not a phone call. And so these things are not we don't know how hard that is for a deceased person to come through a medium. We don't know. So thank you. That might have been a lot. That might have been like running a marathon. We don't know. So be grateful um, that they tried. Awesome. I'm not going to ask you about the soul phone. I'm not going to ask you about the soul phone. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you. So this has been so, so awesome. Dr. Julie Bashel has been our guest. Again, the book you're going to want to check out is Love in the Afterlife. And if you know somebody who needs those cards, oh, I'm not the scientist. She is. She's the world-renowned expert in after-death communication. But I think it might be 
efficacious for somebody who needs it. Julie, thanks so much for being here. Any final thoughts? Anything we we kind of missed that we should cover with people? Join the Winbridge Research Center email list. And then if you want to, to hear me hawk my goods, then join my email list at juliebphd.com. Awesome. Well, it's fantastic seeing you again and having you on the me show. Too. It's awesome. Thank you. Thanks again to Dr. Julie Beischel for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview is, what has happened to after-death communication as a quote-unquote scientific pursuit? I don't get it. This is one of the fundamental questions of humanness. Think of all the silliness that goes on around humanness and transhumanists and all the rest of this. How can this area where somebody's already spaded the soil and turned up a lot of stuff, how can this be so ignored? Well, I think you know how, at least my opinion, but I want to hear yours. What's going on? Why do you think this is? Let me know your thoughts. Love to hear from you. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.